This is chapter 22 of Catching Fire. Here are the questions. How does PETA comfort the morphling girl before she dies? Two, what does Katniss notice about her skin that was scarred by the fog? Three, why does Finnick want to stand guard on this night? Four, what gift does Katniss ask for? Five, what amuses Katniss and Finnick on this morning? Six, what is the message that goes along with the second gift? Seven, which three tributes does the group see stumbling on the beach? Eight, what happened to this group and who else was with them? Nine, why does Joanna bring Guiris and Beatty to the group? And ten, Guiris keeps muttering tick tock. What does Katniss finally realize this means? All right, 22. Peter drops a sheath and buries his knife into the monkey's back, stabbing it again and again until it releases its jaw. He kicks the mutt mut away, bracing for more. I have his arrows now, a loaded bow, and Finnick at my back, breathing hard, but not actively engaged. Come on then, come on, shouts Peter, panting with rage. But something has happened to the monkeys. They are withdrawing, backing up trees, fading into the jungle, as if some unheard voice calls them away. A game maker's voice, telling them this is enough. Get her, I say to Peter, we'll cover you. Peta gently lifts up the morphling and carries her to the last few yards to the beach while Finnick and I keep our weapons at the ready. But except for the orange carcasses on the ground, the monkeys are gone. Peta lays the morphling on the sand. I cut away the material over her chest, revealing the four deep puncture wounds. Blood slowly trickles from them, making them look far less deadly than they are. The real damage is inside. By the positioning of the openings, I feel certain the, best the beast ruptured something vital, a lung, maybe even her heart. She lies on the sand, gasping like a fish out of water, sagging skin, sickly green, her ribs as prominent as a child's. We stare at the jungle, numb and exhausted. In the quiet, I notice that the spots where the fog droplets touch my skin have scabbed over. They stop hurting and begin to itch intensely. I try to think of this as a good sign that they are healing. I glance over at Peta, at Finnick, and see their bolts scratching at their damaged faces. Yes, even Finnick's beauty has been marred by this night. Don't scratch, I say, wanting badly to scratch myself. But I know it's the advice my mother would give. You'll only bring infection. Think it's safe to try for the water again? We make our way back to the tree Peta was tapping. Finnick and I stand with our weapons poised while he works the spile in, but no threat appears. Peta's found a good vein and the water begins to gush from the spile. We slake our thirst, let the warm water pour over our itching bodies. We fill a handful of shells with drinking water and go back to the beach. It's still night though. It's still night though dawn can't be too many hours away unless the game makers want it to be. Why don't you two get some rest, I say. I'll watch for a while. No, Katniss, I'd rather, says Finnick. I look in his eyes, at his face, and realize he's barely holding back tears. Mags. The least I can do is give him the privacy to mourn her. All right, Finnick, thanks, I say. I lay down on the sand with Peta, who drifts off at once. I stare into the night, thinking of what a difference a day makes. How yesterday morning, Finnick was on my kill list, and now I'm willing to sleep with him as my guard. He saved Peta and let Mags die, and I don't know why. Only that I can never settle the balance owed between us. All I can do at the moment is go to sleep and let him grieve in peace, and so I do. It's mid-morning when I open my eyes again. Peta's still out beside me. Above us, a mat of grass suspended on branches shields our faces from the sunlight. I sit up and see that Finnick's hands have not been idle. Two woven bowls are filled with fresh water. A third holds a mess of shellfish. Finnick sits on the sand, cracking them open with a stone. They're better fresh, he says, ripping a chunk of flesh from a shell and popping it into his mouth. His eyes are still puffy, but I pretend not to notice. My stomach begins to growl at the smell of food and I reach for one. The sight of my fingernails caked with blood stops me. 
I've been scratching my skin raw in my sleep. You know, if you scratch, you'll bring on infection, says Finnick. That's what I've heard, I say. I go into the salt water and wash off the blood, trying to decide which I hate more, pain or itching. Fed up, I stomp back onto the beach, turn my face upward, and snap. Hey, hey, Mitch, if you're not too drunk, we could use a little something for our skin. It's almost funny how quickly the parachute appears above me. I reach up, and the tube lands squarely in my open hand. About time, I say, but I can't keep the scowl on my face. Hey, Mitch, what I wouldn't give for five minutes of cons conversation with him. <clears throat> I plunk down on the sand next to Finnick and screw the lid off the tube. Inside is a thick, dark ointment with a pungent smell, a combination of tar and pine needles. I wrinkle my nose as I squeeze a glob of the medicine onto my palm and begin to massage it into my leg. A sound of pleasure slips out of my mouth as the stuff eradicates my itching. It also stains my scabby skin in a ghastly gray-green. As I start on the second leg, I toss the tube to Finnick, who eyes me doubtfully. It's like you're decomposing, says Finnick. But I guess the itching wins out because after a minute, Finnick begins to treat his own skin too. Really, the combination of the scabs and the ointment looks hideous. I can't help enjoying his distress. Poor Finnick. Is this the first time in your life you haven't looked pretty, I say? It must be. The sensation's completely new. How have you managed it all these years, he asked. Just avoid mirrors. You'll forget about it, I say. Not if I keep looking at you, he says. We slather ourselves down, even taking turns rubbing the ointment into each other's backs where the undershirts don't protect our skin. I'm going to wake Peta, I say. No, wait, says Finnick. Let's do it together. Put our faces right in front of his. Well, there's so little opportunity for fun left in my life, I agree. We position ourselves on either side of Peta, lean over until our faces are inches from his nose, and give him a shake. Peta, Peta, wake up, I say in a soft, sing-song voice. His eyelids flutter open, and then he jumps like we've stabbed him. Ah! Finnick and I fall back in the sand, laughing our heads off. Every time we try to stop, we look at Peta's attempt to maintain a disdainful expression, and it sets us off again. By the time we pull ourselves together, I'm thinking that maybe Finnick Odair is all right. At least, not as vain or self-important as I thought. Not so bad at all, really. And, just as I've come to this conclusion, a parachute lands next to us with a fresh loaf of bread. Remembering from last year how Hamish's gifts are often timed to send a message, I make a note to myself. Be friends with Finnick. You'll get food. Finnick turns the bread over in his hands, examining the crust, a bit too possessively. It's not necessary. It's got that green tint from seaweed that the bread from District 4 always has. We all know it's his. Maybe he's just realized how precious it is, and that he may never see another loaf again. Maybe some memory of Mag's is associated with the crust, but all he says is, this will go well with the shellfish. While I help Peta coat his skin with the ointment, Finnick deftly cleans the meat from the shellfish. We gather around and eat the delicious sweet flesh with the salty bread from District 4. We all look monstrous. The ointment seems to be causing some of the scabs to peel, but I'm glad for the medicine. Not just because it gives relief from the itching, but also because it acts as protect protection from that blazing white sun in the pink sky. By its position, I estimate it must be going on 10 o'clock that we've been in the arena for about a day. 11 of us are dead, 13 alive. Somewhere in the jungle, 10 are concealed. Three or four are the careers. I don't really feel like trying to remember who the others are. For me, the jungle has quickly evolved from a place of protection to a sinister trap. I know at some point we'll be forced to re-enter its depths, either to hunt or to be hunted, but for right now, I'm planning to stick to our little beach, and I don't hear Peta or Finnick suggesting we do otherwise. For a while, the jungle seems almost static, humming, shimmering, but not flaunting its dangers. Then in the distance comes screaming. Across from us, a wedge of the jungle begins to vibrate. An enormous wave crests high on the hill, 
tapping the trees and roaring down the slope. It hits the existing seawater with such force that even though we're as far as we can get from it, the surf bubbles up around our knees, setting our few possessions afloat. Among the three of us, we manage to collect everything before it's carried off except for our chemical riddled jumpsuits, which are so eaten away, no one cares if we lose them. A cannon fires. We see the hovercraft appear over the area where the wave began and pluck a body from the trees. Twelve, I think. The circle of water slowly calms down, having absorbed the giant wave. We rearrange our scent our things back on the wet sand and are about to settle down when I see them, three figures, about two spokes away, stumbling onto the beach. There, I say quietly, nodding in the newcomer's direction, Peta and Finnick follow my gaze. As if by previous agreement, we all fade back into the shadows of the jungle. The trio's in bad shape, you can see that right off. One is being practically dragged out by a second, and the third wanders in loopy circles as if deranged. They're a solid brick red color as if they've been dipped in paint and left out to dry. Who is that? asked Peta. Or what? Mutations? I draw back an arrow, readying for an attack. But all that happens is the one who was being dragged collapses on the beach. The dragger stamps the ground in frustration and, in an apparent fit of temper, turns and shoves the circling, deranged one over. Finnick's face lights up. Joanna, he calls, and runs for the red things. Finnick, I hear Joanna's voice reply. I exchange a look with Peta. What now, I ask. We can't really leave Finnick, he says. Guess not. Come on, then. I say grouchily because even if I'd had a list of allies, Joanna Mason would definitely not have been on it. The two of us tromp down the beach to where Finnick and Joanna are just meeting up. As we move in closer, I see her companions in confusion sets in. That's Beatty on the ground on his back and Wyrus who's regained her feet to continue making loops. She's got Wyrus and Beatty. Nuts and bolts, says Peta, equally puzzled. I've got to hear how this happened. When we reach them, Joanna's gesturing toward the jungle and talking very fast to Finnick. We thought it was rain, you know, because of the lightning, and we were all so thirsty. But when it started coming down, it turned out to be blood. Thick, hot blood. You couldn't see, you couldn't speak without getting a mouthful. We just staggered around trying to get out of it. That's when blight hit the force field. I'm sorry, Joanna, says Finnick. It takes a moment to place blight. I think he was Joanna's male counterpart from District 7, but I hardly remember seeing him. Come to think of it, I don't even think he showed up for training. Yeah, well, he wasn't much, but he was from home, she says, and he left me alone with these two. She nudges Beatty, who's barely conscious, with her shoe. He's got a knife in the back. He got a knife in the back at the cor cornucopia, and her. We all look over at Wyrus, who's circling around, coated in dry blood and murmuring, tick-tock, tick-tock. Yeah, we know, tick-tock. Nuts is in shock, says Joanna. This seems to draw Wyrus in her direction, and she careens into Joanna, who harshly shoves her to the beach. Just stay down, will you? Lay off of her, I snap. Joanna narrows her brown eyes at me in hatred. Lay off her, she hisses. She steps forward before I can react and slaps me so hard I see stars. Who do you think got them out of that bleeding jungle for you? You. Finnick tosses her writhing body over his shoulder and carries her out into the water and repeatedly dunks her while she screams a lot of really insulting things at me. But I don't shoot because she's with Finnick and because of what she said about getting them for me. What did she mean? She got them for me? I asked Peta. I don't know. You did want them originally, he reminds me. Yeah, I did, originally. But the ans but that answers nothing. I look down at Beatty's inert body, but I won't have them long unless we do something. Peta lifts Beatty up in his arms and I take Wyrus by the hand and we go back to our little beach camp. I sit Wyrus in the shallows so she can get washed up a bit but she just clutches her hands together and occasionally mumbles tick-tock. 
I unhook Beatty's belt and find a very heavy metal cylinder attached to the side with a rope of vines. I can't tell what it is, but if he thought it was worth saving, I'm not going to be the one who loses it. I toss it up on the sand. Beatty's clothes are glued to him with blood, so Peter holds him in the water while I loosen them. It takes some time to get the jumpsuit off, and then we find his undergarments are saturated with blood as well. There's no choice but to strip him naked to get him clean, but I have to say, this doesn't make much of an impression on me anymore. Our kitchen table's been full of so many naked men this year, you kind of get used to it after a while. We put down Phoenix mat and lay Beatty on his stomach so we can examine his back. There's a gash about six inches long running from his shoulder blade to below his ribs. Fortunately, it's not too deep. He's lost a lot of blood though. You can tell by the pop pallor of his skin and it's still oozing out of the wound. I sit back on my heels trying to think, what do I have to work with? Seawater? I feel like my mother when her first line of defense for treating everything was snow. I look over at the jungle. I bet there's a whole pharmacy in there if I knew how to use it, but these aren't my plants. Then I think about the moss Mags gave me to blow my nose. Be right back, I tell Peta. Fortunately, the stuff seems to be pretty common in the jungle. I rip an armful from the nearby trees and carry it back to the beach. I make a thick pad out of the moss, place it on Beatty's cup, and secure it by tying vines around his body. We get some water into him and then pull him into the shade at the edge of the jungle. I think that's all we can do, I say. It's good. You're good with this healing stuff, he says. It's in your blood. No, I say, shaking my head. I got my father's blood, the kind that quickens during a hunt, not an epidemic. I'm going to see about Wyrus. I take a handful of the moss to use as a rag and join Wyrus in the shallows. She doesn't resist as I work off her clothing, scrub the blood from her skin, but her eyes are dilated with fear, and when I speak, she doesn't respond except to say with ever-increasing urgency, tick-tock. She does seem to be trying to tell me something, but with no beady to explain her thoughts, I'm at a loss. Yes, tick-tock, tick-tock, I say. This seems to calm her down a little. I wash out her jumpsuit until there's hardly a trace of blood and help her back into it. It's not damaged like ours were. Her belt's fine, so I fasten that on too. Then I pin her undergarments along with beadies under some rocks and let them soak. By the time I've rinsed out Beatty's jumpsuit, a shiny clean Joanna and peeling Finnick have joined us. For a while, Joanna gulps water and stuffs herself with shellfish while I try to coax something into Wyrus. Finnick tells about the fog and the monkeys in a detached, almost clinical voice, avoiding the most important detail of the story. Everybody offers to guard while the others rest, but in the end, it's Joanna and I who stay up. Me, because I'm really rested. She, because she simply refuses to lie down. The two of us sit in silence on the beach until the others have gone to sleep. Joanna glances over at Finnick to be sure, then, turn, then turns to me. How'd you lose Mag? In the fog. Finnick had Peta. I had Mags for a while, then I couldn't lift her. Finnick said he couldn't take them both. She kissed him and walked right into the poison, I say. She was Finnick's mentor, you know, Joanna says accusingly. No, I didn't, I say. She was half his family, she says a few moments later, but there's less venom behind it. We watched the water lap up over the undergarments. So what were you doing with nuts and bolts, I ask? I told you, I got them for you. Amos said if we were to be allies, I had to bring them to you, said Joanna. That's what you told him, right? No, I think, but I nod my head in assent. Thanks, I appreciate it. I hope so. She give me, gives me a look filled with loathing, like I'm the biggest drag possible on her life. I wonder if this is what it's like to have an older sister who really hates you. Tick tock, I hear behind me. I turn and see, Wyrus has crawled over. Her eyes are focused on the jungle. Oh, goody, she's backed. Okay, I'm going to sleep. You and Nuts can guard together, Joanna says. She goes over and flings herself down beside Finnick. Tick tock, she whispers. I guide her in front of me and get her to lie down, stroking her arm to soothe her. 
She drifts off, stirring restlessly, occasionally sighing out her phrase, tick-tock. Tick-tock, I agree softly. It's time for bed. Tick-tock, go to sleep. The sun rises in the sky until it's directly over us. It must be noon, I think, absently. Not that it matters. Across the water, off to the right, I see an enormous flash, and as the lightning bolt hits the tree and the electrical storm begins again, right in the same area it did last night. Someone must have moved into its range, triggered the attack. I sit for a while watching the lightning, keeping warriors calm, lulled into a sort of peacefulness by the lapping of the water. I think of last night, how the lightning began just after the bell tolled. Twelve bombs. Tick-tock, warriors says, surfacing to consciousness for a moment, and then going back under. Twelve bombs last night, like it was midnight, then lightning, the sun overhead now, like it's noon, and lightning. Slowly, I rise up and survey the area, the lightning there. In the next pie wedge overcame the blood rain where Joanna, Wyrus, and Beatty were caught. We would have been in the third section right next to that when the fog appeared. And as soon as it was sucked away, the monkeys began to gather in the fourth. Tick tock. My head snaps to the other side. A couple of hours ago at around 10, that wave came out of the second section to the left of where the lightning strikes now. At noon, at midnight, at noon. Tick tock, wire says in her sleep. As the lightning ceases and the blood rain begins just to the right of it, her words suddenly make sense. Oh, I say under my breath, tick tock. My eyes sweep around the full circle of the arena and I know she's right. Tick tock, this is a clock. Okay, that's 22.